It is good to be with all of you again tonight. I hope you are doing well. As usual, we plan on getting together for worship this coming Lord's Day at 9 o'clock in the morning. And if you're able to join us for that, I hope you can sign up on the Sign Up Genius account as we're still in a little bit of a, a, a low point in terms of the virus. Our numbers are still not good in Dane County. We're heading in the right direction. Things are improving. So as we continue to improve, as we reconsider adding back the 1030 service, uh, it's more important than ever that we sign up for 9 a.m. so we know how many we're dealing with, how many to expect, and uh, then we'll know where to go from there. So if you could sign up for this Sunday, I would appreciate it. And if you need any help signing up, please get in touch with either me or with Kenna. Give me a call at 608-224-0274 or send an email or uh, get in touch in some other way. I'd love to hear from you. If there's anything that we need to remember in our prayers, anything that needs to be added to the bulletin, please let me know. I would love to hear from you. I'm starting tonight with a picture from this past Sunday. I hope Caleb will forgive me, but uh, I thought it was awesome to see somebody leading the singing with gloves on. Uh, this is not something we see every day at the Four Lakes Congregation, but as some of you know, uh, those of you who have been with us over the last couple months, we have been worshiping with the doors and the windows wide open as we have over the past several months. And we are continuing that even with the chilly weather. And we're doing it just to get a little bit more ventilation, maybe make it a bit safer as we come together for worship to make sure that we can continue doing this. We're doing whatever we can. And I appreciated seeing the gloves with the song leading this past Sunday. And I'll admit I did have a little bit more trouble than usual switching from one page to another with my notes. Uh, it's a little bit harder when you cannot feel your fingers to <laughs> be handling paper in the pulpit. But uh, it was not bad at all. Really, it was not that bad. Uh, but it looks like Caleb might have had some kind of insulated flannel shirt on and a hoodie. Uh, personally, I was test driving a brand new down vest from Goodwill this week. When I found it at Goodwill, it still had the price tags on it from Macy's here in Madison. It, I think it was $100 at Macy's. The tag said never been worn. And I got it from Goodwill for whatever Goodwill sells vests for, seven or eight bucks. And so I was test driving that this past Sunday and it worked well. I really was not that cold on Sunday. And I, I mentioned this to my family, by the way, about the down vest. And my daughter said, so that explains the feather in the lint trap uh, of the dryer. <laughs> so she was a little bit concerned about that, finding a feather. Uh, where in the world did this come from? But uh, that was from the new vest. So anyway, if you could make it to worship with us safely this week, we are looking forward to seeing you. I hope that it works out for you to be there. Uh, several times over the past few months, I've thought to myself, God's people have worshipped in all kinds of circumstances since this world began, including in caves, in holes in the ground, in the middle of fields, and wherever they could get together. And even with our present situation, we are incredibly blessed as a congregation to have a safe and relatively comfortable place to meet together. So we hope to see you this coming Sunday at 9 a.m. if at all possible. Be sure to sign up online and get in touch if you need any help with that. Tonight we get back to our study of the book of Luke, and by way of review, uh, we know Luke is a Gentile, and he is a medical doctor later in the New Testament in Colossians chapter 4, I believe it is. Uh, Paul refers to Luke as the beloved physician, and Paul on his missionary journeys had some health concerns of his own, and so it was very valuable, very helpful for him to have a doctor along on some of those trips. And so Luke writes the book of Luke, and he also writes the book of Acts, and both books are addressed to a man by the name of Theophilus. And Luke makes a point of writing in chronological order. Uh, he researches his account, so it's well-researched. He also includes a number of people who are often overlooked and sometimes oppressed in the ancient world, women and Gentiles and Samaritans, as well as the sick and the poor and a number of other groups that are not very well represented elsewhere. Uh, in our study of the book of Luke that has gone on for a number of months now, we are now in the last week leading up to the Lord's crucifixion. So we're just a few days away from it time-wise in the study of Luke that we're doing. And tonight we pick up halfway through Luke chapter 20. And so if you have your Bible, I hope that you can join me in Luke chapter 20 tonight. We're about halfway through. And we will be using the Harmony of the Gospels again tonight. This is a book that I've recommended many times through the years, especially over and over again over the past several months. Uh, basically, the Harmony of the Gospels is just the four gospel accounts arranged in columns side by side. 
parallel to one another so we can compare and contrast between those four accounts. And so we have everything arranged in, in columns and in chronological order. It's very easy to follow along that way. The harmony is especially helpful in the last week of the Lord's life before his crucifixion. We have a lot going on in the four gospel accounts. Uh, most of the book of John gets added in here. I think starting in John chapter 13 basically is what we would call the Last Supper all the way through the end of the book. Uh, it's just uh, highly concentrated in the second half of John. So all of that gets thrown in here. And so the harmony is especially helpful in sorting through all of this and figuring out what happens when and in what order. And what is especially helpful in the harmony that most of us have been using is the chart, I think it's on page 349, it is next to the last opening in the Harmony of the Gospels. And on that chart, on the right-hand side, the authors list the events of the last week along with the section numbers. And so it is very, very helpful. On the left side of that opening is the whole a three and a half year period of the Lord's life, so kind of expanded a bit, but on the right hand side it's focused in on the last week. And that has been very helpful to me through the years in figuring out the order of those events. And so I'll just refer to that chart, and if you have that at home, I would encourage you to look into that. Based on that chart, we're now looking at what happens on Tuesday morning of the last week. Last week we had the Jewish leaders questioning Jesus' authority. By what authority do you do these things? Of course they were referring uh, to his teaching but also to his cleansing of the temple. Uh, he went outside the chain of command as they saw it and so they were upset about that and so who told you to do this kind of thing? They were challenging his authority and in response you may remember we had Jesus telling a parable about a man who planted a vineyard and then sent a series of messengers to collect the rent from these tenant farmers. And then followed by his own son who they killed. They abused the messengers who were sent previously. Well, we closed last week by looking at the challenge of the poll tax. You know, should we pay the tax? And that was their question, trying to get the Lord in trouble. And that's where Jesus called for a coin. And he turned it back on them. Whose inscription is this? Well, it's Caesar's. And of course, render to Caesar the things that are Caesar and to God's the things that are God's. Just so a, a brilliant answer. They really didn't have an answer for that themselves. And so that's kind of where we left off last week. So we pick up tonight with Luke chapter 20, verse number 27. So Luke chapter 20, verses 27 through 40. I know probably most of you joining us tonight are able to see this. Uh, but there are usually six, seven, eight of you who are joining us only on the phone. So that's why I point this out. If you're joining us on the phone, we're in Luke chapter 20, verses 27 through 40. That's what I'll be reading next. And then we'll uh, have some comments on that paragraph. So Luke 20, 27 through 40. Now there came to him some of the Sadducees who say that there is no resurrection. And they questioned him saying, Teacher, Moses wrote for us, that if a man's brother dies having a wife, and he is childless, his brother should marry the wife and raise up children to his brother. Now there were seven brothers, and the first took a wife and died childless, and the second, and the third married her, and in the same way all seven died, leaving no children. Finally, the woman died also. In the resurrection, therefore, which one's wife will she be? For all seven had married her. Jesus said to them, The sons of this age marry and are given in marriage, but those who are considered worthy to attain to that age and the resurrection from the dead neither marry nor are given in marriage, for they cannot even die any more, because they are like angels and are sons of God being sons of the resurrection. But that the dead are raised, even Moses showed in the passage about the burning bush, where he calls the Lord the God of Abraham and the God of Isaac and the God of Jacob. Now he is not the God of the dead, but of the living, for all live to him. Some of the scribes answered and said, Teacher, you have spoken well, for they did not have courage to question him any longer about anything. Now, if you're following along in the harmony or if you have some cross-references here, little uh, numbers or letters 
uh, by the, the quotes and the passages here, you'll notice that this account is also found in Matthew 22 and also in Mark chapter 12. So in the harmony, they're all three side by side. Uh, but if you have to look that up, you could also look over in Matthew 22 and Mark 12. All three accounts agree that the Sadducees step in at this point. Previously, we've seen the scribes and the Pharisees only. And now we have a sect of the Jews that we haven't seen before in the book of Luke. So the Sadducees are brand new here in Luke 20, 27 in the book of Luke. Uh, they're described as coming to John for baptism along with the Pharisees in Matthew chapter 3. And according to Mark's account, they seem to have been sent by the religious leaders along with the Pharisees to try to trap Jesus with some trick questions in Matthew 16 and also in Mark chapter 12. Uh, the Sadducees also make several appearances in the book of Acts. There are a few references in the opening chapters. And then also there's a reference in Acts 23 verse 8 where Luke, by the way, the author of this here in Luke and also the author of Acts, he expa explains in Acts 23 verse 8 that the Sadducees say that there is no resurrection nor an angel, nor a spirit. But the Pharisees acknowledged them all. And so there Luke is explaining to his reader, Theophilus, what the Sadducees believe. Because by the time uh, Theophilus reads this account, he might not be familiar with the Sadducees. And so Luke has to explain this. And we're thankful that he did, because now we have that explanation for us. If you need help remembering what the Sadducees believe. I'll let you in on a trick that some of us learned back when we were little children. The Sadducees didn't believe in the resurrection. That is why they are sad, you see. I don't know who taught me that, uh, but it goes back many years. But they are Sadducees. They don't believe in the resurrection or the spirit world or in the angels. They believe in the law of Moses, but not much else. They didn't believe in the oral traditions that were passed down by the Pharisees. And so they kind of had a different authority system in the way that they looked at things. And they didn't think that they could find a spirit world or the resurrection or angels in the first uh, five books of the Bible. So here it all comes down to them. The scribes and the Pharisees at this point have failed to trick Jesus. So they're the last line of defense. It's only the, the Sadducees who are left. And uh, it's, it's just them against the Lord at this point. So they have their own version now of a trick question, going back to their own particular twist on doctrine. Uh, there's nothing like a complicated marriage scenario to try to stump a preacher. So sometimes people will come to preachers. Uh, person A marries person B who then gets together with person C and D and then E gets involved. You know, it's, it's just this really... A convoluted scenario to try to trick the preacher. So that's kind of what they do here. And they start by quoting the law of Moses. So in that sense, they're off to a good start off, aren't they? They, they quote the word of God. So they bring that out from Deuteronomy 25. And basically, the law of Moses says that if a guy is married but dies before having children, his brother is to take his widow as his own and is to raise up children in the brother's name. And that seems to be um, that this was done in part to protect the woman. So she does not uh, get reduced to a life of prostitution or begging or get overlooked in some way. And so her brother-in-law basically is to step in and to bring children into that relationship. So I know to us that sounds strange. That's the way God arranged it. We need to remember the people were passing through the wilderness at the time. And so he did this to, I'm assuming, protect the women in that scenario. So the Sadducees step in. They remind Jesus of what the law says. So now that they come in with the common authority, we all believe the law of Moses. This is what it says. There's no dispute there. And so now they come in with this hypothetical scenario. There are seven brothers, okay? But the first one dies, leaving the wife childless. The second one steps in. He dies. Number three, four, five, six, seven step in until they're all dead. And this is the scenario. And I think personally, I'm starting to feel sorry for brother number seven. I don't know about you, um, but I'd be pretty nervous if I was brother number seven here at this point. But, you know, what has this woman done to my six older brothers? Uh, but that's not their question, is it? That, that's not the way they're approaching this. So they're trying to make Jesus either agree with them that there is no resurrection and therefore alienate the Pharisees and pretty much everybody else who does believe in some version of the resurrection, or 
they're trying to uh, force Jesus to somehow contradict the law of Moses, which would uh, give them a reason for putting him on trial as a, as a blasphemer of some kind. So they're, they're trying to get him in a tough spot here. You know, you can either agree with us or disagree with the law of Moses, and pretty much everybody's mad no matter what answer is given here. So this is their question. Once the woman dies, in the resurrection, therefore, which one's wife will she be? Now notice in their argument, the way, thinking back on this, two brothers, number one and number two, would have pretty much presented the same problem, right? Brother one, he dies. Brother two takes over. Everybody dies. They go to the next life. Which one is, is she married to, right? That would have fit the bill. That, that would have been acceptable as a, as a scenario here. But they don't leave it at that, do they? they? They hype it up. They use seven. So kind of throwing in here seven as a number of, complete, of, of completeness. Uh, much more dramatic than just two brothers, although the two would have done it. So seven brothers. And I'm thinking of the situation with Jesus and the disciples. Forgive, you know, how many times? Seven, 70 times seven, that kind of thing. Seven is like a complete or perfect number. Uh, also in the book of Revelation, we think of the seven churches of Asia that we're about to study in our uh, Sunday morning uh, gatherings for worship. We're about to study those seven congregations. Uh, seven trumpets in the book of Revelation. Seven bowls of wrath and seven seals and, and so on. So they, they, they bring this number seven here to hype it up, make it look even uh, more uh, huge than it really is. Uh, the three accounts are pretty similar up to this point, but here Luke leaves something out that's included in Matthew and Mark. In Matthew and Mark, Jesus starts his answer by saying, you are mistaken, not understanding the scriptures or the power of God. So for some reason, Luke doesn't start with that insult. Luke steps in where the others uh, leave off and they include, but uh, Luke does not start where the other two start. And I don't know why. Uh, maybe writing to Gentile people, he does not see the need to cut on the Jews quite as much as some of the others do. I don't know, but he moves right into the explanation that marriage is only for this life and that those who make it to the next life neither marry nor are given in marriage. And so this is part one of Jesus' answer here. Basically, you're wrong, as we see in the other two accounts. You understand neither the scriptures nor the power of God. That's humiliating, isn't it? To publicly be told you don't know what you're talking about. Uh, but also notice that although this is a highly hypothetical situation, I find it interesting Jesus does not attack it on that basis. Uh, he doesn't say, oh, that would never happen. Uh, he doesn't attack it in that way, but he takes them back to the scripture. So since everybody in this scenario, in theory, believes in the authority of the scriptures, that's where he takes this. Then he doesn't leave it there, but notice he continues. No longer on defense, but now the Lord goes on more of an offense. He, he takes them to the law of Moses, and Jesus has a scripture of his own, doesn't he? So he comes back with something they didn't bring up. But that the dead are raised, even Moses showed. And then he quotes from Exodus 3 in the passage about the burning bush. Uh, just a side note here, notice how Jesus references this scripture. He says in verse 37, in the passage about the burning bush. And I would just point out here, he doesn't reference, you know, as the Bible says in Exodus chapter 3, verse 7, on page 189 of our Pew Bibles. He doesn't say that, does he? Now, obviously, the Bible hadn't been divided into chapters and verses then. They didn't have those divisions. And so I would just point out, he says, in the passage about the burning bush. And I find that interesting. So he's directing them to where to go in the scriptures. So you can find this yourselves. This is where you need to go looking for the answer here. And I kind of find that interesting that he talks in that way. We also have a reference or two in the book of Hebrews. Time will fail me if I say this or this, or as it says somewhere. He doesn't quote from a direct passage, but he says as it says somewhere. So kind of similar to what's going on here. Um, but nevertheless, when the Lord is called the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob, in that passage, he doesn't say that he was the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, but he says that he is the God of these three men. So it's in the present tense. It's not that he's the God of the dead, uh, but he is the God of the living. Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob are still alive in some form. So that is the Lord's argument 
uh, based on the tense of a verb that's used way back in Exodus. So that is his response to this hypothetical situation. By the way, I would point out just briefly that Jesus' response uh, contradicts some key doctrines in both Mormonism and Islam. And we don't have time to go into that, but those two groups teach that marriage and sexual pleasure continue from this life into the next one in some way or another. So feel free to look into that on your own. Uh, but Jesus, though, teaches that things are different in the next life. Things are not the same, especially when it comes uh, to marriage and relationships between men and women like that. Uh, what I uh, think is awesome here also is that some of the scribes now speak up and say, uh, Teacher, you have spoken well. <laughs> the scribes could have just kept quiet. But as I see it, Jesus has now silenced their enemies. And in my mind, I can almost see the scribes' jaws drop open. Wow. And it almost slips out, almost like they didn't intend to say this. The scribes are, were just attacking Jesus themselves, uh, but now they, oops, wow, Jesus, that was a great answer. Uh, they almost couldn't help but saying that. And in the end, in verse 40, Luke tells us that the Sadducees pretty much give up at this point. Uh, they've been completely defeated publicly. They are done, and so they're out of this conversation. But at least I wanted to point out that it does seem kind of interesting uh, that the scribes pipe in here at the end kind of in awe of the Lord's answer. At this point in Matthew and Mark, we have another challenge. Uh, Matthew tells us that when the Pharisees hear Jesus had silenced the Sadducees, they get together almost in a huddle. Let's regroup a little bit here, and they come up with a new question of their own. Mark says that uh, this happens when one of the scribes recognizes Jesus has answered him well, so that's what we find here in Luke. So uh, putting Matthew and Mark together, it sounds like the scribe is one of the Pharisees. In Matthew, he's referred to as a lawyer. So I would take it that this man is a scribe by trade. That's what he does for a living. But since his job, his full-time job, involves copying the Word of God by hand over and over and over again, he knows what he's talking about. And people would come to him for advice on God's law. And so he is a lawyer. He's uh, an expert in the law of Moses. So he's very knowledgeable. So he's a scribe and he's also a Pharisee. No contradiction here between the accounts. And here, he, this man comes to Jesus, and he wants to know what commandment is the foremost of all. So it's not really a trick question. It's more of a thought question, more of wanting to know Jesus' thought on this. And Jesus answers, the foremost is, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one Lord, and you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind and with all your strength. That's a quote from Deuteronomy 6, verses 4 and 5. And then Jesus goes on to give what he sees to be the second greatest commandment. The scribe didn't ask for number one and number two, he just asked for the greatest. And he goes on and he quotes from Leviticus 19, verse 18, You shall love your neighbor as yourself. And the scribe then agrees with Jesus. Yes, that's a good answer. And he adds that these commands are much more important than all burnt offerings and sacrifices. We get this as we add all of this together from the uh, different accounts. And Jesus, seeing that the man has answered intelligently, says to him, You are not far from the kingdom of God. And after that, nobody has any more trick questions. One thing I find interesting there is that Jesus is judging these people, isn't he? Jesus has issued... A judgment. You are not far from the kingdom of God. Some of them are close to the kingdom, others are apparently far away. And what I want to point out there is these people came to judge Jesus. They were there to investigate and to pass judgment on Jesus and his authority and who he is and where he's come from and who told you to do this stuff. So they were there to judge him, but really what's happening is Jesus is judging them. And here he issues this ruling, you are not far from the kingdom of God. And I'm assuming that this was all quite concerning to these men. One of their own, this scribe, seems very close to, we might say, falling for what Jesus is teaching here. This man is amazed by the Lord's answer, and the Lord is amazed by the scribe's answer to his answer to his question. So there almost seems to be this mutual respect going on between the scribe and Jesus himself here. And so I'm thinking that was probably pretty concerning to the others who were not persuaded 
uh, some of the other leading scribes, Pharisees, and the Sadducees are kind of losing their grip, uh, even on their own leadership team. Well, that brings us to Luke 20, verse 41. Luke 20, 41, where Jesus now turns it around, and now he has a challenging question for them. So let's look at Luke 20, verses 41 through 44. Luke 20, 41 through 44. Then he said to them, How is it that they say the Christ is David's son? For David himself says in the book of Psalms, The Lord said to my Lord, Sit at my right hand until I make your enemies a footstool for your feet. Therefore David calls him Lord, and how is he his son? And so uh, Jesus has a trick question of his own. They've been asking him trick questions for a couple days now. Now he's throwing it back. So instead, however, of trying to trick them or embarrass them, it seems that the goal is perhaps more to make them think. Because it's actually a question about Jesus himself. They don't see this at this time, but Jesus is asking them a question about himself. There's a bit more set up in Matthew's account, as you'll see if you're looking at these side by side. Jesus comes to the Pharisees as they're gathered together in their little huddle, and he says, what do you think about the Christ? Whose son is he? And they answer, the son of David. And in Mark and Luke, Jesus just starts out by saying, how is it that they say that Christ is David's son? But the point here at the beginning is that it's common knowledge. Everybody knows that the Messiah is considered to be the son of David. But in Matthew's account, Matthew points out that Jesus makes them say it. He wants them to see this for themselves. I would almost look at this as those six or so questions on our baptism study guide. We looked at it about a month ago. We want the person we're studying with to come to some realization of some things on their own. We're not telling them what to think, but we want them to see this. And that's kind of what Jesus is doing, doing here. Uh, once everybody agrees that the Messiah, yes, is indeed the son of David, Jesus then introduces this quote. And as we know, if we have a, a modern Bible with uh, footnotes and that kind of thing, it comes from Psalm 110, verse 1. And Jesus wants to know, if David calls the Messiah Lord, then how is he his son? And it's interesting to me, we really have no resolution to this question here in this passage, do we? There's no answer that's given. Jesus just leaves it hanging. He asks this challenging question, not really to nail them or embarrass them publicly, but, but he's asking, how is the Messiah, the son of David, but also his Lord? And he just leaves it there. And to me, it seems that the answer is the Messiah was to be both God and human. Yes, he is David's Lord in the sense that he is deity, but he's also David's son in the sense that he is a descendant of David. And that's something that the scribes and the Pharisees and the religious leaders back then really hadn't figured out yet. And so it seems that Jesus is planting this seed in their minds so that perhaps over the next several days, weeks, and months that some of these men might think back on this discussion and they might come to a proper understanding of the situation. Mark tells us at this point that the great crowd enjoyed listening to him. And Matthew says that no one was able to answer him a word nor did anyone dare from that day on to ask him another question. And then Luke here obviously just leaves it with no real explanation at all. It, it seems to me we can learn from this when we study with people, when, when we ask them a question. I know it's very tempting for us to jump in and try to fill in any awkward silences, but silence is okay sometimes when we're studying the Bible. If we don't know the answer, it's all right to let it sink in and think about it for a little bit. We don't need to jump in and answer it for somebody, but we can allow them to just hang there a little bit uh, with, the, with the thought that's there, wondering what is, what is the answer uh, to this question. Sometimes we need to think a little bit. And so here Jesus has this challenging question, and he leaves it there. He doesn't give the answer, uh, but he allows uh, these men to just kind of think about this for a little bit. Okay, let's move on then to Luke 20, verses 45 through 47. The next paragraph, Luke 20, 45 through 47. And while all the people were listening, he said to the disciples, 
Beware of the scribes who like to walk around in long robes and love respectful greetings in the marketplaces and chief seats in the synagogues and places of honor at banquets, who devour widows' houses and for appearance's sake offer long prayers. These will receive greater condemnation. Well, this account here in Luke is a highly, highly condensed version of what we have in Matthew. In Matthew, Matthew chapter 23, Jesus absolutely destroys the scribes and the Pharisees relentlessly in gruesome detail, calling out their hypocrisy for an entire chapter. Woe unto you for this, woe unto you for that, over and over again. But here in Luke and also in Mark, we have just a brief, brief summary of what happens over in Matthew chapter 23. Remember Matthew written to the Jewish people, they would have more interest in that. And so he's just humiliated the scribes and the Pharisees by answering their series of questions over the last day or two. And now he absolutely goes on the attack against these people, just devastating them with these accusations that everybody would have seen as being the truth. And what I find interesting in this passage is sometimes uh, thinking about this, we realize, as far as I can tell, Jesus never does this to to tax collectors and prostitutes. I don't know if that makes sense. Matthew 23, it's a whole chapter just condemning the Pharisees left and right. But as far as I can tell, he never has that, that attitude toward a tax collectors and prostitutes. So why is that? Why does Jesus attack the religious leaders like this, but he never lashes out verbally at other sinners? And, and I think the reason is the tax collectors and the prostitutes, they know that they're sinners. The religious leaders are not ready to admit that. They're faking it, and they're, they're hypocrites. So the tax collectors and the prostitutes, for the most part, they know that they're lost. These are terrible things that we're doing, and we admit that what we're doing is wrong. But the scribes and the Pharisees are hypocrites. They're living in sin, they're not admitting it, and they're going out there and putting on a good face and trying to make people think that they're way more righteous than they are. And so I think for that reason, Jesus really has to call them out on it publicly and severely in a way that's just brutal, um, in a way that he does not do uh, for other sins. In Luke, he's focused on the scribes, their show-offs. They want public displays of respect. You got to call me, you know, rabbi this, doctor that, whatever. Uh, they want the best seats everywhere that they go. They want to be at the head table. Uh, they devastate widows to fund an extravagant lifestyle. They're, they're stealing, in a sense. They lead long prayers, not to talk to God, but just to make themselves look good. So they're the kind of people who use huge words, words you've got to go home and look up in the dictionary. Uh, Jesus' conclusion to calling them out like this is to say that these people will receive greater condemnation. And we could ask, well, what is that? What is greater con condemnation? Well... Um, we don't know exactly what greater condemnation is. But it's not good, is it? <laughs> I think I would kind of leave it at that. Um, lesser condemnation, even that wouldn't be good. And so greater condemnation sounds even worse. So Jesus is obviously extremely angry with these people. And again, this is just a summary. This is just a very tame summary. Uh, there's a whole lot more over in Matthew chapter 23. If you want to look into that, go for it. But uh, he really... Uh, really gets in, uh, gets into it in Matthew chapter 23. So we'll just leave it at this, but I, I do want to move into Luke 21 briefly tonight uh, because of the timing of it. There's a huge contrast here. We have this passage and Jesus' wrath toward the religious leaders in Matthew 23. And then also on Tuesday morning, right after this, he moves directly into what happens next. And it, the, we have an unfortunate chapter break here. Really, the chapter break should have happened after uh, the next passage. So let's just turn over before we end tonight with Luke 21, verses 1 through 4. Luke 21, 1 through 4. And he looked up and saw the rich putting their gifts into the treasury. And he saw a poor widow putting in two small copper coins. And he said, Truly I say to you, this poor widow put in more than all of them. 
For they all out of their surplus put into the offering, but she out of her poverty put in all that she had to live on. And I just want us to notice the huge contrast here. On one hand, we have wealthy religious leaders giving in a way to be seen and to be praised. They want everybody to see what they're giving. And then on the other hand, we have this poor widow. Remember, as we've discussed in our introduction to Luke and every review since we began, Luke lifts up the poor and the widows. And this woman is both. She is both poor and a widow. And Jesus praises this woman. Just a few observations here, starting with the fact that Jesus is watching as people are giving. Mark's account says that Jesus sat down opposite the treasury and began observing how the multitude were putting money into the treasury. So this was intentional. He didn't just, oh, wow, look, accidentally notice something. But he sat down for the purpose of looking and observing how people were giving. Uh, back in the olden days, we might have gone somewhere like the mall to people watch, right? Um, I don't think I ever did that, but that's the thing. Uh, go to it, you know, at the airport, you've got a few hours to kill. You sit there, kind of watch what people are doing. So uh, an airport, a mall, something like that, just watching and observing. Uh, and here Jesus sits down for the purpose of watching people give. So thousands of people coming through town, uh, getting ready for the Passover, and, and he's watching. Um, that's a little weird to us, isn't it? It's a little bit strange to pay attention to what people are giving. Usually when we give, or I, I should say, again, back in the olden days, back when we used to uh, pass the baskets during worship, I think most of us kind of tried not to watch. I think, I mean, I, I, I don't ever remember looking and trying to notice. In fact, the opposite would be true. As people give, we're, we're kind of, <laughs> hopefully we're focused just on what we're doing. We're not there to see what other people are giving. We aren't staring and trying to look at the amount and, and the attitude that people have. But, but here, <laughs> Jesus has no qualms about that. Jesus is observing, as Mark puts it, and he notices, number one, how much people are giving. He sees the amount, doesn't he? Uh, in Mark's account, the rich are putting in large sums. Well, I kind of ask myself, how would he know that? A couple possibilities. Either he's using his miraculous supervision, a little x-ray vision kind of going on, and he's noticing from 50 yards away or whatever it is exactly what the people are giving, and he's able to calculate that. Or there's another possibility, and that is the people are making a big deal out of it. And they're announcing it. I hereby give this kind of thing. And based on what he's just said moments before about these people being hypocrites who make a show for the purpose of getting praised, it's probably pretty safe to assume that these people make a point of showing off how much they're giving. Uh, speaking of the mall, I think about those coin whirlpools we used to see sometimes. I don't know, I have not seen one of those for years, but some of you may know what I'm talking about. They're for, I don't know, Make-A-Wish Foundation or something, and they're maybe five feet across, and you put the coin in and roll it, and it goes around and around and around and around until it falls down in the bin uh, down at the base of it. I kind of think of something like that. In fact, we have some historical records that seem to indicate that the offering bins in the temple were shaped like trumpets. And so you could make a lot of noise by throwing uh, particular coins in. You could really draw attention to yourselves, uh, to yourself doing it in that way. So maybe that's the case. I don't know. Uh, but I see men doing something like that with their gold coins. And so Jesus notices how much they're giving. But also notice, secondly, he knows that these men are rich. And so he sees not only the amount that they give, but Jesus looks at the person and he's able to see who they are financially. And he knows this as they're giving. And so he's got the spreadsheet there or whatever we might say today. He knows their net worth. So they're giving a lot, but Jesus also knows that they have a lot. Now, in the same way, notice Jesus also notices the same things about the widow. He notices the amount, two small copper coins, and then also he notices her circumstances, that she is poor. And Jesus observes that this woman actually puts in more 
than all of those who gave out of their surplus. Just a thought question before we end tonight. Jesus says that this woman, out of her poverty, put in all that she had to live on. Do we think that this woman went home that afternoon, that evening, and starved to death? Maybe that's something we could think about tonight. Jesus specifically said this woman gave everything. She gave all that she had to live on. That's what he says. So I guess my thought question for us, did that woman go home and starve to death? Is this it? Is this the end of the road? She gave everything and went home and starved. Do we think that God took care of this woman? I'm thinking that God had a way of looking out for her. And I, I'm, we don't know what happens after this. We know that God has had a way of taking care of widows and so on in the past. But then personally, how can I be more like her? And how can I be less like the Pharisees and those who are making a big deal out of their giving? And I think that maybe that's kind of a thought question for us to end with tonight. Um, how can we be more like her and less like those Jesus was accusing here? Um, by the way, somebody has suggested that this is Jesus' last public teaching. This is it. This is his last sermon, his last Bible class, if we want to call it that. This is his last public teaching. From here, we're going to see next week, he takes the apostles aside. So it's just him and the twelve. He takes them aside to the Mount of Olives. And from here on, then we head into the crucifixion, and, and it goes from there. So what he says here about the widow is actually Jesus' last public teaching. This is how his public ministry ends. Well, that leads us to a good place to take a break for tonight. And so we will end here. And next week, we hope to pick up with Luke chapter 21, verse uh, 5, I guess it is. And, uh, and move on from there. I think we already covered verse 4. So we'll, uh, anyway, we'll, we'll leave off. Uh, this is the breaking point, I guess, between verses 4 and 5. And Jesus leaves the temple probably on Tuesday afternoon as he's heading back out of town for the evening. And I put the parallel passages up here, Matthew 24 and 25, and also Mark 13. So those uh, three chapters from the parallel accounts are what we'll kind of be looking at next week. So if you want to look ahead, uh, that's where we're headed. Uh, thank you for being with us tonight, either online or on the phone. Uh, be sure to send me any prayer requests, any way that we can be helping you, any way we can serve as a congregation, and anything we need to be praying about so I can get that updated in the bulletin. But let's close tonight by going to God in prayer. Our Father in heaven, you are the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. We praise you tonight as being the God of the living. Thank you for Jesus. Thank you for the good news, and thank you for saving us through his life. Thank you for telling us about the poor widow. We pray that you might give us opportunities to follow her example as we serve the world around us quietly and behind the scenes in a way that draws attention not to us, but to you. Give us the courage to use our resources to share in a way that helps. Thank you for loving us. Thank you for being patient with us. Thank you for forgiving us, and thank you for making us a part of your family here on this earth, the church, the kingdom of your Son. We come to you in the name of Jesus, our Lord and our Savior. Amen.